Okay, let's get started. I don't think anyone's gonna miss the Zoom, the Zoom knock on the door chime after this year. So good evening uh, and thank you for joining me uh, for the 2021 Deans and Chancellors Award Ceremony. I'm Alex Wolf and I'm Dean of the Baskin School of Engineering. I wanna welcome and congratulate our graduating seniors. And a warm welcome to the family members and friends of our award recipients. We are grateful to you for supporting our students. Your support has been an important part of their success and you should take great pride in the accomplishments that we are, we are honoring tonight. I would also like to welcome uh, my colleagues, Jim Whitehead, who's the Associate Dean for Undergraduate Affairs and Carmen Robinson, Director of Student Excell Excellence, Engagement and Inclusion. I also wanna acknowledge the incredible support provided by Lindy Beauvoir. And I also want to uh, call out the names of the marvelous mentors for these projects, uh, Russ Corbett-Didick, Sri Kurniawan, Mircea Teodorescu, Aviva Lur, who's actually a graduate student, David Draper, Nader Pormond, John Stanley, David Burnick, Ryan Modlin, another graduate student, Angus Forbes, Oscar Ellick, and Alvaro Cardenas. Thank you to the mentors for the work that they do in, in helping our students be the best they can be. This academic year has been a particularly challenging one for our students, faculty, and staff, as it has been for everyone around the world. So the work we are honoring this evening is all the more remarkable for its quality and creativity. I'm tremendously proud of all of our awardees and grateful for the effort and dedication of their faculty mentors. Before I start the formal part of the, part of the ceremony, I'd just like to encourage you to use the chat feature to share uh, your congratulations and, and thanks. The university's deans and councils, <laughs> deans and chancellors awards recognize undergraduate students for outstanding scholarship and creativity. Dean's awards are granted to the most outstanding undergraduate research theses or projects completed during the academic year within an academic division. Chancellor's awards are granted to the most excellent submissions out of the Dean's award winners in each academic division. This year, seven outstanding projects have been awarded the Dean's Award in Baskin Engineering. Of those, two were selected to receive the Chancellor's Award uh, in celebration, in a celebration that took place uh, yesterday evening. The Dean's Award projects each received a $100 prize, while each Chancellor's Award project receives a $500 prize. Tonight, you will hear about our seven award-winning projects in brief videos. The work that we are recognizing tonight spans a wide variety of, of very, very interesting topics. Technology to visualize the complex variations of a given species genome, an automated system that eliminates the hazards associated with long-term mask wearing, a simple non-enzymatic method of glucose detection, an analysis of the first known malware that attacked an electric power grid, a biodegradable thermoplastic derived from bacterial cellulose to replace contemporary agricultural plastic films, an analysis of horizontal gene transfer in Wallabakia, a bacteria found in many arthropods, and a 3D visualization of cosmological data. Baskin Engineering is tremendously proud of, of this excellent and very original research. So congratulations to all award recipients. We will now get a taste of five of our Dean's Award winning projects. Um, these will be shown as, uh, as I said, as short videos. So Lindy.
Slime Mold is known for its ability to detect food sources and find the shortest path to grow efficiently. When given a map of the United States and food sources that correspond to the locations of our cities, its structure becomes similar to the actual highways. Surprisingly, it is also used to find the distribution of the dark matters in the universe. This time, their food source is the galaxies. Our interactive online tool allows users to explore the network of galaxies estimated by simulating the growth pattern of slime mold using computers. But what if the actual slime mold was used in this experiment? What would it look like if slime mold connects the galaxies in our universe? To produce such images, we implemented the custom physically based appearance model of slime mold using computer graphics. We then applied this appearance model to the cosmic whip data to render the structure of dark matters that is made of slime mold. Our interactive online visualization tool allows users to explore the network of galaxies as well as slime mold appearance rendering of the corresponding view. Thank you. Hi there, we're the 2020 UCSC iGEM team. This year, our project is Comoplastics, and we're working to eliminate polyethylene-based films in agriculture. Current polyethylene films are commonly used because they are elastic. However, they often end up in landfills, which pollutes the environment and harms the people in its vicinity. Current biodegradable films are not elastic enough to be used in agriculture and degrade too quickly over the course of the growing season. That's why we're working to create a cellulose-based thermoplastic film. As you can see, these films are not elastic. This is why growers resort to using polyethylene. We are engineering a cold culture consisting of bacterial cellulose and CBMs, or carbohydrate binding molecules. CBMs bind to cellulose and prevent hydrogen bonding between the cellulose microfibrils, decrystallizing cellulose and allowing it to become more flexible. Elasticity and the ability to melt are important qualities we want in our thermoplastic. Here's a sample of our bacterial cellulose that we've grown so far. Hi, so right now we're doing gene block assembly and plasticizer testing. Even though only four of us are allowed in lab at a time, we're still getting closer to our cellulose-based plastic. Yeah, so right here, Sophia's holding on some samples from our plasticizer testing. All right, we gotta go do lab work. Yeah, so we gotta go. Get out of here. Bye. Bye. Super saw the top secret stuff. See you next time. Yeah, if you could leave a little faster. Okay, bye. Many months later. During the iGEM Jamboree this past November, our team presented our project to a panel of judges and participated in poster talks. Coma Plastic received a gold medal as well as a nomination for best environmental project. We are the first UCSC IHM team to receive a gold medal and we are honored to have received the Dean's Award. We would like to say thank you to Dean Wolf for honoring us with this award and for the continued support for our work. We would also like to thank David Burdick and Ryan Maudlin for their mentorship and abundant support throughout the entire project. The IHM program is continuing at UCSC and we appreciate your continued support of our program. Multiple of our teammates are heading to graduate school, employed in laboratories, and graduating this June. Our iGEM experience was very rewarding, and even though our time in iGEM is over, we hope that our work leaves a foundation for future teams to improve upon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we've been in the pandemic for over a year now. Uh, coronavirus, new strains are developing and all we can do is continue to wear masks while new vaccines are being developed for the new coronavirus strains. 
Um, mask wearing is it curbs transmission rates and is very effective. However, there is an issue associated with prolonged mask wearing. After my research online yielded the fact that uh, rebreathing CO2 while wearing a mask for prolonged durations, prolonged durations are unavoidable when someone's traveling or at work. Uh, rebreathing CO2 can result in anything from dizziness to fatality. And uh, as an independent researcher and, and, and engineering student, and being familiar with microcontrollers and how they're pretty much in every gadget around a house, uh, I realized that there needs to be some kind of system that monitors CO2 levels and actuates alarm behavior for a user that uh, can effectively warn them when threshold levels of CO2, in this case 5,000 parts per million, is being passed because uh, 5,000 parts per million poses uh, things beyond dizziness and, uh, and the like. Um, uh, so effectively this system uh, monitors and actuates alarm behavior that can be toggled on and off by the user. Um, and uh, I, I, I went, when I first started this I began to become familiar with how um, different microcontrollers can be used in a sens sensor actuator fashion. Uh, and while iterating through several designs and different parts um, on a breadboard, I basically used the same code and same overall layout with little changes here and there. But writing it uh, was the real task. And now that uh, the proof of concept has been done, and I stuck with the same sensor throughout the design, I am going to use a printed circuit board to make this commercial. And effectively the printed circuit board design is going to be low cost, high efficiency, so I will choose uh, circuit designs and different components to optimize that.
Hello all, my name is Michelle Schimberg and I am a member of the Pormon Lab. Today I'm going to be talking about my project, which is the development of a non-enzymatic electrochemical glucose sensor using copper oxide. So a little bit of background first. Glucose is typically the primary source of energy for all organisms undergoing some sort of metabolism. And the range in humans is typically between 70 to 110 milligrams per deciliter or converted that's about four to six millimolar. Diabetes is a disease characterized by chronic hyperglycemia or elevated levels of glucose affecting well over 420 million people worldwide. Currently there is no available cure but maintenance of the disease involves monitoring of blood glucose levels and may even involve insulin injections. Electrochemical biosensing is a very popular method used in the biosensor industry. It offers a high sensitivity, wide range of detection, low cost, and simple instrumentation. Traditional glucose sensors have actually used glucose oxidase to catalyze the redox reaction that occurs, which is then electrochemically measured. However, glucose oxidase, like other enzymes, are known for having lower stability, more stringent operating conditions, higher cost, and potential interference from other species. As an alternative, many different metals have been explored. Copper in particular has been explored due to its increased abundance and highly catalytic properties. In this paper, we were able to create a copper electrode, which is used as the sensing platform. So copper was electrodeposited onto a platinum electrode using copper sulfate and then oxidized in sodium hydroxide. The actual detection of glucose was done using linear sweep voltammograms. They were applied to the system, which was in a sodium hydroxide electrolyte solution. Glucose was then added incrementally. And lastly, we did a specificity test to test against structurally similar sugars and potentially interfering species. In the results on the left, we can see that glucose was detected from 625 nanomolar up to 30 millimolar and was oxidized at around 0.6 to 0.7 volts. On the right, you can see that there was no significant detection with structurally similar sugars or with any potentially, potentially interfering species. Thank you. Wow, that, that, that was spectacular. That was a, that was a lot of fun. So a, a round of applause for the, those five projects, please. Virtual applause. Thank you. Those were really, really great. I'm going to turn now to our Chancellor's Award recipients. Um, as I said, there was a uh, ceremony last night with the Chancellor, uh, and uh, in which the projects were were uh, were recognized, um, and two of our projects went forward to that. First, uh, Dominic Lucchese and Aviv Brook um, had a project, have a project entitled Analysis of the First Malware to Attack a Power Grid. Uh, Dominic graduated and Aviv is about to graduate after earning degrees in computer science. Second project, Serafina Maria Neves from, um, from in, who's in the bio, Molecular Engineering and Bioinformatics Program, uh, had a project entitled Identifying and Investigating Wolbachia to Arthropod HGT Events. So let's see brief videos describing those two projects. Hello, my name is Aviv Brook. And my name is Dominic Lucchese. And today we're going to present our analysis of the first malware to attack a power grid. We would like to thank Avra Cardenas, Luis Salazar, and Sebastian Castro for introducing us to this problem and for helping us so much through every step along the way. On December 17, 2016, during a cold winter in Ukraine, a fifth of Kiev experienced a blackout with their power cut off for one hour. This was the result of a cyber attack against a Ukrainian energy distribution company. 
This incident came just over a year after the last cyber attack against Ukraine's power grid on December 23, 2015, which was the first known instance where a cyber attack had disrupted a power grid. Unlike the 2015 attack, where circuit breakers were manually opened repeatedly through remote access, this attack was carried out by a malware framework that performed the same task in an automated fashion, repeatedly opening circuit breakers faster than an operator could close them. Slovakian cybersecurity firm ESET named the framework Indestroyer, the first known malware specifically designed to attack electrical grids. To put our work in context of existing analysis of this malware, the only openly available existing analysis has been done by two cybersecurity companies. However, the reports are high level, and more importantly, they focus on the malware infection of Windows computers, but do not have enough detail of the industrial component of the attack. In our research, we restricted our scope to the main payload we believe was used on the night of the attack, as well as the destructive data wiper component. For our dynamic analysis, we set up a lab using an isolated virtual network separated from the host operating system and from the internet. To simulate the original attack, we ran the malware on a Windows XP machine with a server connected to fake circuit breakers. For our static analysis, we looked at the low-level code of the main payload to try to reverse engineer its flow of operations. Through our analysis, we determined how the main payload selects all of the circuit breakers it can find before ultimately signaling all of them to open, which cuts off power. We were also able to determine that the data wiper component deletes critical files before rendering the host machine unusable. This attack is believed to have been carried out by a Russian cyber military unit known as Sandworm. This is the same group believed to have caused the 2015 attack as well. Though and Destroyer was designed to send commands in four different electrical transmission system protocols, the protocols could easily be swapped out for those used in the United States or Western Europe. In fact, it is very likely that Sandworm was using Ukraine to test out techniques that it might someday repeat elsewhere. Cyber attacks against our critical infrastructure, including the power grid, can create large-scale societal and economic damages. In order to detect and respond to these attacks, we need tools to analyze the methods of attackers. The analysis of malware is a well-established field in information technology networks like banking or electronic commerce, but this field is still in its infancy when dealing with power systems. With the most recent attack on the Colonial Pipeline, it is clear that maintaining a proper defense against infrastructure attacks has become more relevant than ever before. Hopefully our work can help the United States industries and government be more prepared and secure against similar types of attacks. Hello, my name is Serafina Nieves and I am an undergraduate senior in biomolecular engineering and bioinformatics. I'm in the lab of Dr. Russell Corbett Dedig, which studies evolutionary genomics, and today I will talk a little bit about my project on horizontal gene transfer. I study horizontal gene transfer between Wolbachia and arthropods. Wolbachia are a bacterial endosymbionts of a broad range of arthropod species. This means that they live within arthropod cells, which includes the cells of organisms such as bees, ants, and spiders. Studies have estimated anywhere from 20 to 66% of arthropod species show evidence of Wolbachia infections. Wolbachia bacterium have interesting effects on the biology of their hosts. For instance, they can change the apparent sex of their arthropod hosts, they can change their reproductive behavior, and they can even change the number of viable offspring that the arthropod has. These properties make Wolbachia a very interesting organism to study, and even an important organism for controlling biological populations of disease vectors, such as mosquitoes carrying malaria. But Wolbachia have other interesting characteristics too. For instance, it has been shown that Wolbachia actually transfers genes from its own genome into the genome of its arthropod hosts. In my project, I sought to identify these horizontal gene transfer events. When do they occur and how often do they occur? In addition, I looked at what these genes were doing in their new environment. Are they accumulating mutations more rapidly, creating a better fitter, more efficient protein, 
or are these genes being rapidly lost from the genome, almost as if they were never there? I used a variety of computational methods to identify these gene transfers and look at their properties. For instance, I checked the read sequencing depth from whole genome sequencing data. I looked at the gene expression of these transfer genes compared to genes of the host organism. And I also looked at these Wolbachia transfer genes for characteristics of eukaryotes, such as introns. In the end, I found that most genes that transferred from Wolbachia to arthropods were being rapidly lost from the genome after degrading. These genes are accumulating mutations that change the protein at a rapid rate and are doing it so quickly that they basically fall out of the range of our detection. I would like to thank Dr. Russell Corbett Dedig for his guidance on this project. I would also like to thank the Research Mentoring Internship Program and Dr. Zia Isola for the financial support and the many resources that they provide. I would also like to thank Dr. Angela Brooks for her support of the RMI program. Two more wonderful projects. Actually, just an amazing, amazing work too. Um, sounds simple, all of these projects in some sense, the way they're presented, but they're very, very, very challenging. So on behalf of uh, my colleagues on the faculty and staff of the Baskin School of Engineering, I want to congratulate all our award winners. I want to thank uh, all of you for coming and, and attending this ceremony this evening. Um, I want like to see you all, or some of you anyway, uh, on the 11th of June, um, just a few short days away, uh, for the slug crossing. And uh, be sure to tune in to our virtual commencement ceremony. You can get information on the ceremony and, and commencement uh, events at commencement.ucsc.edu, or you can find information, uh, specific information for Baskin Engineering on the Baskin Engineering homepage. Uh, you'll see there that the guest speaker for our Baskin Engineering graduation ceremony will be Guy Kawasaki. Uh, who is the chief evangelist of Apple and a trustee of the Wikimedia Foundation. And as some of you may know, 2022 marks the 25th anniversary of the founding of the Baskin School of Engineering. We are planning a number of special events to mark this really important milestone. And we hope that you will stay connected with the school and be a part of our 25th anniversary celebrations as our newest alumni. So thank you again for joining us this evening. Best wishes to our graduates. Stay in touch and congratulations. Thank you.